Our guest today is Rita Felsky, who is the William R. Keenan Jr. Professor of English at the University of Virginia. Uh, she's also the Niels Bohr Professor uh, at the University of Southern Denmark, and she's the editor of New Literary History, one of the most influential journals in the field of literary studies. Uh, she's also the author of a recent book, Limits of Critique, published in 2015, uh, a book that's initiated a great deal of discussion uh, in uh, literary studies. And she's in town this week as the guest of our BYU Humanities Center. So welcome, Professor Felsky. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Um, I want to begin by reading a little passage out of your book, which is about the inception of this book, The Limits uh -huh, of Critique, so. and ask you uh, to comment on this a bit. Mm -hmm. You say, in a previous book, um, I took a stab uh, at sustained attention to the sheer range and complexity of aesthetic experiences, including moments of recognition, enchantment, shock, and knowledge. Such experiences speak to academic as well as lay practices of reading that connect us to our lives as social beings, while also inviting us to reflect on the distinctive qualities of works of art, uh, what spurs us to pick up a book or become utterly engrossed in a film. Uh, we cannot do justice to these qualities, I argued, as long as we remain in the thrall of suspicious hermeneutics. Um, and you go on to say, responses to this book that you'd written uh, were not unsympathetic, but some readers expressed a certain puzzlement, as if I had somehow failed to grasp the self-evident rigor and intrinsic sophistication of critique. I had not adequately explained to myself or others, it became clear, why this deference to a particular methodology struck me as misguided. The Limits of Critique, this book, is my attempt to remedy this deficit and to settle some unfinished business. So unfinished business, this book. Uh, explain that a bit more, if you would. Sure. Um, yeah, so I think, as you can tell a little bit from that quotation, you know, uh, one of the reasons for writing the book was, was just a kind of sense of increasing fatigue uh, with a mode of interpretation that I was certainly very familiar with. Um, that I'd practiced myself over many years. You know, I should say that my own turn to, you know, I went to graduate school in the early 80s. So I've been in the academy for 35 years. Uh, my own intellectual career has very much overlapped with these kinds of modes of critical and suspicious reading. And they were certainly incredibly important for my own development. You know, as a scholar, I'm interested, for example, in gender issues, in feminist scholarship. Um, a lot of these new ideas really turned uh, literary studies upside down in good ways. They helped to reinvigorate thinking. It was great that we had all these critical and suspicious modes of, of thinking that turned what had been a rather complacent field of literary studies upside down and got us to ask, you know, challenging new questions. At the same time, now that's now, you know, it's now almost it's a good 40 years, really, since those methods started coming into literary studies. Mm -hmm. They've now become very well established. They've now even, I would argue, have become somewhat predictable. They're not telling us that many new things anymore. And so I really feel that it's time to take stock and decide, you know, what do we want to do? Do we want to keep on writing and thinking only in this critical mode, or are there other, other things we could be doing? Okay, very good. One of those uh, terms uh, that's so important in the book, and it's a really important term in literary studies, and you're writing against it, is this idea of suspicious hermeneutics. Right. Uh, for listeners who may not know exactly what that means, mm -hmm. you know, what, what, what is that? Okay. So this term hermeneutics of suspicion, um, it actually comes from a French philosopher called Paul Ricoeur, and he used it when he talked about, you know, the, the work of Freud, for example, that Freud taught people to read suspiciously, you know, to look for hidden meanings and repressions behind your innocuous everyday uh, comments, wherever it might be. And I really like this term. It's actually not a term that's used very much in literary studies, or at least it wasn't until recently. Mm. Uh, it was used a lot, for example, in religious studies, in intellectual history, and in other fields. Uh, but when literary studies... When, when scholars in literary studies read suspiciously, they usually describe themselves as being engaged in this thing called critique. You know, critique has really been the dominant word in literary studies. And I wanted to talk about critique, but I wanted to use this word hermeneutics of suspicion rather than the more usual term critique. And the reason I found that term valuable is precisely because it has those two words in it, hermeneutics and suspicion. And so it really, that word, I think that phrase rather, really encourages us to think quite carefully about what's going on when we engage in critical reading. It's both a hermeneutics, it's a certain method of interpretation that has itself certain distinctive features that can be described. And it's also a certain attitude, it's a certain mood, it's a certain ethos, it's a certain disposition, one that is broadly speaking suspicious and distrustful and wary. And so part of the point of the book really is to try and describe or re-describe that way of interpreting and that attitude as a way of then trying to think also of some other possibilities. Terrific. That's a great explanation. Um, uh, what, you mentioned a moment ago that these, um, uh, 
These modes of critique that draw upon this hermeneutics of suspicion have been with us for some 40, 40 years. Mm -hmm. uh, there still is a tremendous amount of supposed or imagined energy around such thinking. Why has that been such a captivating mode of interpretation among literary scholars, do you think? Mm -hmm. Well, I think there are a variety of reasons. I mean, first of all, as I, as I, you know, as I indicated earlier, I, mean, I think critique was very, very important in the development of new fields of study. So my own field, feminist studies, women's studies, now gender studies usually, would not have been possible without critique, without you know, challenging some of the taken-for-granted assumptions about what men are, what women are, what literature is. And, and the same is true for you know, uh, critical thinking around race, around sexuality, around a whole range of other issues. So as social movements came into university, obviously one of the main tools they had at their disposal was critique to, to question taken-for-granted assumptions and beliefs. And of course, more broadly, I mean, critique has been part of the whole development of certainly Western intellectual histories, and I think other intellectual histories as well. You know, uh, you know, you go back to Kant. Um, the whole idea of critique is the idea that you should not take things on trust, right? You should not okay. just do things because people say you should do them. You have to use your reason to question and to and to challenge ideas. So that is one important reason, um, and that's the reason I think that people who engage in critique um, often use when they justify why they're doing what they're doing. I think there are also other reasons which are not so frequently discussed. I mean, one of the reasons, quite simply, is that critique itself, weirdly enough, this may not be obvious to people outside of universities, but critique itself can be a very pleasurable exercise. You know, it's a bit like playing a game of chess, you know, right. uh, with what you think of as a rather dim-witted opponent, you know. So it can be very pleasurable, actually, to take a novel or a poem and show how it doesn't actually mean what it seems to mean. And you, you, you kind of draw out all these hidden assumptions and you show how it undercuts what it claims to be saying and you draw out these hidden subtexts. And that can be kind of very gratifying. It's a kind of a form of intellectual exaltation, you know, as Sherlock Holmes would say. <laughs> one's, one's grappling with an intellectual puzzle. And that intellectual puzzle can be very, you know, grappling with that intellectual puzzle can be very satisfying. Um, so I think one has often, you know, one feels smart, you know, one feels smart when one engages in a critical or suspicious reading. Uh, and that, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> um, but I do think that if we go around, you know, always with this rather guarded and defensive and suspicious attitude towards literary works, we're also missing out many other important things that are going on, right, when we engage with literature. Okay, excellent. Um, so for if, so say we were not to read suspiciously, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what other kinds of engagement uh, do you advocate, uh, do you explain, describe uh, in your book? Mm -hmm. um, uh, can you explain that to our readers? If we don't sort of think about these texts as things that hide their motives uh, mm -hmm. or that also have sort of ulterior thing to say beyond what they say on the surface, um, how else would we engage them? Right. Well, I think a lot of the practitioners, are, you know, at least the hardcore practitioners of critique, are very worried that if we don't engage in critical thinking, all we have left is a kind of sentimental gushing about literature, right? Mm. All we've got left is appreciation. All we've got left is a kind of, you know, you know, sappy reminiscing about how oh, I loved reading Wordsworth or I, you know, I really enjoyed <laughs> Jane Austen. And that it's going to, that all our kind of intellectual... I did, by the way, enjoy those things. <laughs> <laughs> and that all our intellectual faculties are going to go out the window. Um, and I don't think that's true. So, so, you know, one of the reasons I'm associated with this thing called post-critical reading is to say... You know, we've had critique. Crit critique is very important. We need certainly need serious philosophical and theoretical ways of thinking about literature. Studying literature at a university is not the same as reading for pleasure at home. So obviously we need to learn ways of thinking about literature that have some kind of intellectual sophistication to them. But why not think in intellectually sophisticated ways about the, the pleasures that people get from literature? And not just the kind of pleasures that academics get, but the pleasures that ordinary people get. Um, you know, the fact that you can become really enchanted in a novel or a film, so you lose all sense of time, you become totally absorbed, you feel yourself transported into another world. That's not an illegitimate experience, and yet we have not been very good in talking about it. Or how about the fact that you read a novel and you suddenly see aspects of yourself reflected in, a, in one of the characters, but not necessarily in a kind of comforting way. You actually might feel quite disconcerted uh, that you see some of your un more unpleasant traits, you know, reflected in that particular character. There's a kind of shock of recognition. Uh, you know, again, literary theorists or literary scholars have not been very good at talking about those kinds of experiences of engaging with literature. Currently, I'm actually writing about identification, very ordinary, very routine uh, word that's used to talk about how we become absorbed in literary works. Literary theorists, for the most part, I think it's fair to say, have been rather dismissive of identification. I think there's a lot more going on than, than, than they've given credit for, and that we need to think much more seriously about these, these kind of attachments we have 
to both to literature and to other kinds of works of art. Okay, terrific. Um, so, the question, this, this book has really caused quite a stir among literary scholars. Uh, this came back from a major conference where you were in attendance, and I heard your book invoked uh, a few dozen times. <laughs> if that's an exaggeration, at least two dozen. That would not be an exaggeration. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think it has struck such a chord among literary scholars? Well, it's interesting, actually. I mean, I've been, I, I have myself been a little bit surprised, although, of course, very gratified by the response. And, you know, partly, um, you know, when I was writing the book, it was hard to know um, to what extent my dissatisfaction was a more general dissatisfaction. You know, I thought perhaps I was just having my midlife, or perhaps I should say late life crisis. You know, I've been, <laughs> you know, I've been in the trenches of literary theory for 40 years. I've just read so many of these essays that I've become now um, somewhat uh, disenchanted with them. And that was largely a result, perhaps, of my own biography and history and advancing age that I felt there was nothing new left to be said about, about uh, you know, literary studies in its, in its current format. But what's really surprised me, actually, is um, how much enthusiasm and support I've had from younger scholars, which I had not expected, actually. Um, um, certainly, I think it's especially the graduate students and especially the assistant professors who seem to be responding and saying, yes, isn't this amazing? You know, we've been feeling all these things, but we somehow felt we couldn't say them. And I think one reason they felt they couldn't say them is because the questioning of critique has traditionally been associated with rather, perhaps we might say rather conservative commentators, you know, crusty mm -hmm. old gentleman, you know, someone like Harold Bloom, you know, with his, <laughs> uh, you know, complaints about the school of resentment. Um, so certainly there's a long history of people complaining about critical and suspicious reading in the academy, but it's tended to come from uh, very traditional, very conservative-minded scholars who often seem to want to take us, drag us back, you know, to the decades before feminism, before African-American literature was seriously studied and so on. Whereas my own perspective is rather different. You know, as I'm saying, I'm someone who's um, coming out of a tra tradition of feminist theory. I'm very interested, actually, in things like taking popular culture seriously, um, and expanding the field of literary studies, thinking about why, you know, I know Fifty Shades of Grey, wherever it might be, has an in incredible impact on a large audience. So I think uh, my demographic was slightly different. My intellectual demographic, my social demographic was slightly different from these other more traditional conservative-minded commentators on literary studies. And because I'm quite upfront about saying, you know, I, I'm, I'm a feminist critic, uh, I'm interested in queer theory, I'm interested in all these issues, I write a lot about social class. Therefore, I think all these younger scholars were also quite sympathetic to, the, to my arguments because they felt they could now question the dominance of critique without necessarily being seen as some kind of, you know, reactionary figures. Okay. Interesting you say that. Just, just this week, I had a junior colleague in my office uh, and he, he mentioned your book and he, he, he said that he himself feels as though his own generation, they didn't feel quite as constrained by critiques of what you were saying really resonated mm -hmm. with him. Mm -hmm. He said, this, is, yeah, this, this just this seems right to me. Right. Um, so I, even, even here at BYU, <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard this from colleagues. You know, one of your responsibilities in uh, sort of the university is to uh, edit this very prominent journal, mm -hmm. uh, New Literary History. Do you think uh, that your uh, sensibilities, your, your thinking about critique, the problems or limits of critique, other ways to uh, read by way of identification, attachments, has, uh, have your um, ideas been impacted by your editing of this journal? You're exposed to a lot of new thinking, I guess, in the mm -hmm. field. Or have you um, found yourself arguing against the things you see in your journal? I guess the question makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. So, so has, has, your, has your vantage point been affected uh, um, onto the field by your role as editor of New Literary History? Right. Well, I mean, I'd say that my, my dissatisfactions with critique were certainly developing before I took over the editorship of a journal. But they were, of course, shaped by my own, you know, specific stance and position. I mean, sometimes people say to me, you know, aren't you exaggerating the influence of critique in literary studies? And certainly my, you know, my description is shaped by my own experience and my own perspective, and I recognize that it may not be everyone's perspective. Um, you know, my own training, in fact, I have a PhD in German, I was trained in critical theory. My first job involved teaching, you know, Derrida and Foucault and a lot of French philosophy. Um, so really throughout my graduate career and throughout my early teaching, I was immersed in the full spectrum of literary and critical theory. And that's certainly not true for everyone. It's certainly possible, you know, for example, to make a, a career in literary studies without engaging in critique, and plenty of people do. Um, but I still think, nevertheless, it has been, if not the only mode of approaching literature, one of the most influential modes, one of the most mm -hmm. prestigious modes. 
And I think we see that also in journals in terms of the kinds of works they publish or they don't. And certainly New Literary History too gets, you know, a wide range of submissions from very different perspectives. And I do actually try and make sure I, I, I try and make sure as much as I can that New Literary History does not reflect, you know, my views. It's not Rita Falsky's journal, you know, it's a journal on the state of literary studies. And we certainly quite quite frequently publish compelling essays on aspects of critique. I mean, recently, for example, we published an essay engaging in, uh, you know, a feminist critique of not just Hitchcock, but Hitchcock studies, uh, Hitchcock film studies, that is. So we publish a wide range of different kinds of essays. Um, but certainly I do see one of the goals of new literary history is also leaving them room for these new approaches. There are not so much, as I say, rejecting or jettis jettis jettisoning critique, but trying to also combine it with other ways of thinking about literature. Okay. Um, this journal, New Literary History, uh, is a, I mean, it's a, it's a very influential journal. Um, and you, you're somebody who has, an, uh, for that reason, uh, a good vantage point onto the field of literary studies. Um, what, in your view, uh, constitutes good criticism? I mean, when you see it, what do you, what do you like? What are you drawn to? Um, you mentioned you publish things that are quite diverse, mm -hmm. right? So how, how do you uh, make those kinds of assessments of, of, of quality of contribution uh, for a journal like New Literary History? Well, I think, you know, in some ways, uh, the hope is that a reader is in some ways going to be surprised, right? So we want an essay that is going to say something new, that is going to say something substantial, so it's not going to, just going to repeat familiar ideas, familiar assumptions within literary studies. It's going to give us a new angle on some current debates, a new entry into a conversation that's going to um, not exactly necessarily startle or shock us, but certainly, uh, you know, give us a fresh vantage point on where things stand. And of course, you know, apart from that, it needs to be nicely written. I think that's very important uh, to be written there is in a way that makes it, that renders it lucid and accessible, uh, that can make its point as a rhetorically effective a manner as possible. But the main thing we're looking for is just, uh, you know, fresh new angles, new perspectives on current debates, rather than, for example, essays that, uh, that define themselves in an already quite familiar way of thinking and arguing. Okay. Um, how would you assess um, uh, given those aims, how would you assess the state or health of literary studies today? I mean, would, you, would you say that we are in a really a boom time for fresh new thinking? Would you say that um, we're still looking for an identity? You know, in the in the in the twenty teens. Um, you know, how how would you assess kind of the the health, the quality, the state of the field? Well, I mean, the intellectual. Uh Conditional literary studies can't be totally separated, as you know, from the institutional issues, right? right? And so, you know, we have to think about the fact that there's not a great deal of support, and there's going to be, by the sound of it, decreasing support for literary studies uh, within the political sphere. Um, there's decreasing financial support, there's decreasing support from politicians, from pundits, from commentators of all kinds. Um, you know, skyrocketing tuition means that fewer students feel they can devote themselves to literary studies, even if they want to, or even if they really enjoy taking, you know, literary classes. Some of that during the, you know, some of the times that they're not devoting to their more vocational major. Um, there's the, you know, budget cuts and move towards adjuncts. So, you know, along all those sort of institutional lines, I think literary studies are not doing exceptionally well. But intellectually, I think it's actually a very exciting time. So, um, in terms of the people who are who are surviving and writing and doing new things. I think this is actually a moment when, when the intellectual sphere and the kinds of issues we're interested in are gonna change fairly dramatically. And I think one reason is something you actually already touched on, you know, that you have a lot of younger scholars now who don't see such a rigid division between, for example, academic writing and journalistic writing, mm. between appreciating um, a bit of philosophy and appreciating a sitcom, right? That their, their boundaries <laughs> exactly. are much more fluid right. and they're, you know, they're, they're quite happy to see themselves as fans as well as academics. I mean, at the same time as academic opportunities are, 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 are being restricted quite drastically, you know, there are these new opportunities opening up uh, at least for, for uh, you know, what you might call kind of para-academics to publish through these new online uh, journals and venues, you know, the Los Angeles Review of Books, Public Books, a uh, whole range of these, these new possibilities. So I actually think at the moment there's a lot of excitement around this new kind of writing, and there's the opportunity, I think, for much stronger links than we've had in the past between the kinds of things that are going on in the academic world and the kinds of discussion about literature and art and film and music 
that are going in other kinds of spheres. Um, perhaps just one final point on this, you know, there's a new interest now, I'm sure you know, um, especially, you know, running a humanities institute, new interest in this whole idea of the, the you know, the public humanities and the engaged yes. humanities. Yes. And that's something which, again, I think is really valuable. It's not that every scholar should suddenly feel that everything they write has to be immediately accessible to the public. I think that, will, that would be a disaster. But I think certainly taking on board the idea that we should be able to speak, that some of scholars, some of the time, should be willing to reach out and speak to, uh, you know, to public, speak to what I've called intellectual strangers, in other words, people who don't share their intellectual views, and be willing to translate what they're doing for a broader public. I think that's really important, and we need to be we're doing a lot more of that. Yeah, terrific. I was going to ask you, actually, if you thought mm -hmm. that uh, there is a public responsibility uh, mm -hmm. among scholars uh, in literary studies. Um, how much of the work that gets published in a journal like New Literary History do you think is translatable to the public? Um, is, it, is it a small portion? Is it all of it depending on who's doing the writing and the translating? Uh, in other words, are some things more translatable than others? Or just a, or just a matter of the skill to be able to sort of make a larger case to a public leadership? Well, I think certainly some things are more easily translatable than others. I mean, partly that is the question of, you know, the technical language and so on, but also partly it's also an issue of the kind of knowledge base, right? That, for example, a certain academic article might be assuming not just, you know, one series of issues, but a whole series of convoluted debates that have been going on in a particular subfield for the last 30 years, you know, and, and people outside <laughs> the academy won't have a clue about those sort of subtle nuances of those right. particular debates, the narcissistic small differences between scholar X and scholar Y. Um, so certainly I think there is a need for translation and, and I think some people might feel that translation then leads to dilution or dumbing down. Um, but I would see, you know, as just another mode of writing. I mean, you, you're, you know, I'm, I'm very much actually philosophically, aesthetically and theoretically and certainly I draw on, on pragmatist traditions. And so my argument there would be that, yes, when you're writing an essay for, or when you're writing a talk for an academic conference or for an academic volume, that's the place, of course, when you engage in kind of high-octane scholarly debates, right, and you flex your theoretical muscles and you have, show you have an expertise of certain kinds, a mastery of certain kinds of ideas. But then you can write also for another audience, maybe genuinely curious in, and interested in what you're doing, and then you adopt a different vocabulary and you describe things differently. It's actually not necessarily easier to do. You know, I'm someone who's actually was trained, as I say, in a German department. And when I look back, you know, my first book, my second book, you know, I find I find it very hard to read now because the writing is so turgid, because, you know, hegemony and ideology and theorize and problematize come up in virtually every sentence. Uh, and as someone who's, who's actually learned to write in a simpler fashion, I will say it's actually much harder. You know, one, one yes. um, just one kind of final comment there, you know, one um, model there for me actually was my colleague at uh, UVA, Richard Rorty. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't agree with everything that Rorty said by any means, um, but I was very impressed by his ability to take these really quite complicated philosophical debates and express them in a way that resonated with very large audiences, you know, really all around the world. Yeah. I will say, by the way, to those who may not have read this book, Limits of Critique, uh, it's very readable. Uh, it's got, it's got a, a, you mentioned the word turgid, you know, the, the old, which I still write in the turgid, so actually not so much, I hope, but, uh, but, but, but there is a lucidity and a, and, a, and a really liveliness to the writing, which is terrific in this book, uh, and I recommend it to anybody, academic or non-academic. Um, your talk this afternoon at BYU is called Getting It, subtitled Art and Attunement. Is this related to your current work, or is it a departure and a new kind of thinking? Mm -hmm. So it's, I suppose it's, it's the book I'm writing now, which I might see them as being part of a trilogy, if you like. So I had this first book that you mentioned, The Uses of Literature, you mentioned right at the beginning about yeah. modes of recognition and enchantment and so on. I then kind of backpedaled a bit to explain in more detail why I had reservations about critique. And I, I don't want to spend the rest of my life questioning critique. That just, you know, you just end up critiquing critique and going around in circles. You know, why bother? So what I want to do instead is, you know, as Rorty would suggest too, is to come up with different vocabularies, come up with new ways of thinking and writing about works of literature and works of art. And so I'm now writing a book about our attachments to works of art. Why do we become attached to works of art? And today I'm going to be talking about attunement. And so attunement is simply their idea of getting it. And, and what I mean by getting it, you know, is that you could, for example, hear two songs. You know, my example today is going to be Joni Mitchell, actually. You could hear two songs, and there's one song that you might listen to, and you might say, well, this is technically very accomplished, I admire it, you know, it's very beautifully done, and yet it doesn't speak to you at all. 
And then the second song you listen to and you get it, you know, instantly you get it. It speaks to you. It triggers emotions. It triggers associations. Why is it that these two two songs, which might seem at one level to be kind of quite similar in terms of their, you know, their, their construction, uh, their use of music, why is it that one resonates and the other doesn't? So that's something I'm going to be thinking a bit about today, about this kind of slightly puzzling nature of how something clicks with us and another thing doesn't click. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a great subject. Um, and as you point out, it's part of this larger, what you call the trilogy of books, thinking about these kinds of subjects on one sense, um, we have about a minute left, uh, this seems like a, such a timeless subject. On the other hand, it seems so timely. Mm -hmm. uh, could you have imagined writing these books 20 years ago? Or is really the moment just right right now? Yeah, no, I think clearly these books could not have been written 20 years ago. And anybody, you know, I'm writing now, for example, about the idea of presence, right? What does it mean to say that an artwork has a presence? It has a certain kind of vividness and a kind of extraordinary thereness so that you can't not engage with it. Well, you know, given, you know, 20 years ago, we were all still stuck in the throes of deconstruction. <laughs> you could not talk about the idea of presence. That was completely taboo. Right. Um, so there were certain kinds of theoretical orthodoxies at the time, which I think have now, those taboos have softened and weakened somewhat. I mean, they're still there, you know, in some circles. But I think we can now return to uh, those ideas, obviously having gone through the fires of critique, we now look at them rather differently. But I think we can now return to these ideas about why is it that we're astonished struck, overwhelmed by a work of art, and, and ask those questions not to ignore their social aspects, right. but to enfold the social aspects also into discussion of their aesthetic aspects. Well, I'm very happy we're returning to them and, and that you're leading us there. Uh, it's great to have you here at BYU, and thank you for talking to us today on the radio and for our website. Thank you.